When we get in the field, all of us want to move quick and with precision and get great sounding results. The riggers are waiting on us and we want to get things in the air as quickly as possible. But today I want to ask you to slow down just a minute and verify how you can actually make sure it's going to sound good before you send it up in the air. And how we're going to do that is by testing every single box. This is really practical in the install application. You got time and this rig's not going up and down. In the field, it's a little bit harder. and You may not have all the time in the world to verify this the way I'm going to talk about. But regardless, even if you're a production company or a rental company who you're not responsible for it on site, it's good to do this exact same process in the shop and make sure everything's working correctly. And I'm gonna show you exactly how to do that because if you have one box that's behaving poorly in a line array, then somebody in the audience is going to suffer. So here's how to make sure everything in your line array checks out. If you wanna make sure all of your math checks out on your design and calculations and even tuning in the field, make sure and grab my audio math survival spreadsheet. It's at the link below, or you can go to producedbymkc.com slash audio toolkit. Most folks who, who are good at mixing but really are confused by system design, they're intimidated by the math. What, what is the underlying physics and trigonometry that puts it all together? You know there's something more here, but right now you're just kind of guessing at where things go. And so getting comfortable with these concepts of how frequency, period, and wavelength are related are gonna start you down that trail and make sure you actually know what's going on so you can get great results in the field. It helps you understand decibels better. You can figure out passive speaker headroom. You can figure out if you need delay speakers. It helps space your front fills. Anyway, all of this is here um, in, at the link below. And I, I just pulled so much from Bob McCarthy's book and just distilled it into one place so you can have it as a field guide and a quick reference when you're needing to calculate things in the field. All right, let's jump into today's video. Before we dive into the workflow of my specific install, I stole all this from Pat Brown. He has a wonderful article called Line Array Checkout that documents this in detail. Uh, I have a few more things I go through as far as adding the processor into the equation. I'm sure he went through this as well, but uh, I basically took what he did here and did that in the field. I'm gonna just show you how I did it and the results and uh, gremlins that I found in the system. Here is the rig setup. I was at Emmanuel Baptist Church in Little Rock, and this is a interim rig before they get, uh, quote unquote, the real rig installed because they had an old line right that was dying. It was just half the drivers were out. It was bad. So they're able to get a hold of this QSC KLA-12 rig, said, hey, can we hang it? Here's what we got. And we hung it, and uh, the room sounds fantastic. They were actually debating whether or not they want to get the, the, the next line array or not, so I, I'd call the project a success. But first thing I did, apart from making sure the design is right and our, our rigging was going to be safe, is I tested every single box we were going to fly. And how you do that is you make a little batter's box here, and then you have your measurement microphone on the ground. It's a ground plane measurement. And so that is to get rid of any floor reflections that would muddy up the data. Of course, we're putting a measurement microphone around the room. You're gonna get some of that, but this gets it as close to uh, anechoic as we as we can. Uh, again, this isn't perfect. There's, there's still stuff around it, but the, the high frequencies are pointed right at it, and I the, the, the data was still very coherent. We were able to capture it. So I have it six feet away. I usually start there unless the data is looking super weird. You can see here it's staring down the barrel of that. My measurement microphone on the floor. I have it measured out. I have the tape here on this part so we could have consistent results of where I'm placing the speaker. And I've also laid it down to make sure the mic did not move. Here's the speaker looking at the microphone. This is the QSC KLA-12, and I verified it with the settings we were actually gonna use in the air. In this case, we had, it was on normal mode, the gain is at unity or at noon, and we had array configuration five, because we're gonna have bo five boxes in the air. And this is what it looked like after we actually hung it. And then I actually stuck a microphone out in front of this array while it was still floating and tested each box again. And why would I do that? That's because we then added a new variable, a processor on all the line drives. On this setup, I'm cutting directly out of my interface that I had right here. It's looping back and it's my pink noise to be my reference and then it's coming out directly into the back of the speaker. If you're using a passive system, it'll go into the power amp and then a cable directly into one speaker. And as long as you get three boxes to match, like you know, you know those variables within 
the amp and that cable to the speaker are all good, but it was just an XLR directly back in to the speaker since it was active. And that's our, again, we want to eliminate variables and make it simple. So then we had an Allen and Heath AHM 64 was my processor. And we had a left, right in from the main desk at front of house, as well as a sub. So left, right matrix and a sub matrix feeding in. And then I dished them out to all these zones in the PA. So the left fed PA left. And then that cascaded down to five separate outputs. So I had an output for each separate box. This is the my planning file. This doesn't show the processing I actually did in the field, but all of them were driven at Unity Gain. And I made sure that with everything basically blank right here and saw what my response was. And I will now show you the data and what I found. So I use smart for this one, and these are all 10 traces of the KLA 12. So I labeled them KLA 12 left five. So that's the left array box number five, left four, three, two, one, then right five, four, three, two, one. I did them in order. And all these traces of just verifying the box on the ground pointed straight at the microphone, all check out. The, the, the face traces overlap and the magnitude response is incredibly similar. So we are in good shape. One thing I probably forgot to mention is that I ended up using a guitar stand right here to prop up the box. So the center of the throw point at the microphone, since it's a 18 degree box, if we lay it on its side, it would be pointing nine degrees up and I want it to point right at the center there. Just for fun, I also am gonna upload these to Tracebook. If you have not heard of that, tracebook.com. It's an open source uh, platform for you to be able to upload measurements you get in the field so other people can reference them. And so I took a measurement of the KLL 12, KLA 12 at all of its settings. So it's pretty cool. So I've got it all right here. And so you can see that and know what's happening with the processing. For instance, we see an external sub, we lose low end as we can expect it to, the, the phase trace changes and gets steeper. Anyway, so that's all there. So I have some fun data to collect in the field. I also did the same thing with the subwoofers. So I have those here. So I had four KLA 181s. We were only able to hang one on each side because we that was we needed a certain array angle to make it all work. And we wanted to get as many subs in the air as we could with two subs and five down. Uh, you actually can't predict that in Ease Focus 3 because they only give you five boxes per GLL file. So I ended up calling QSC and they're like, we've never had anyone do that before. So we got to do it for the first time in the field. It was definitely an edge case, but it sounded great. So I tested all the all four KLAs. They all matched and you know, phase response match and magnitude. So I'm just making sure everything is checking out before I put it in the air. So that's a lot of measurements to take, but it's worth it. Now move up here, I have a separate folder called AHM64 verify. So if this was a verification before of each of the KLAs with, uh, with them just laying on the ground, now this is them in the air with the, I actually ended up moving to external sub setting, put them on normal and array five, and I tested all of them. So that was all my traces taken. And let's find the gremlin here. There it is. I found that guy had a polarity inversion on the output. So it's, it's face trace is not aligned right here compared to the other ones. And so that's an easy fix. I went into the HM64, selected its output. So that was KLL12 right E. So that's the bottom box, went here on the end, hit there, it flipped over and we were good. So somewhere either in the soldering of the drive lines or on the output at the HM64, there was a polarity inversion. So I was able to sniff that out. You can also hear it in the field. If you stood in front of the box, solo one box, you know, that is working. And if I added in the other one, I would get a bunch of low cancellation. So that's why a polarity version is bad because now everything is 180 degrees out of phase with everything else in the array. Therefore it's working directly against it and I'll get a cancellation. So always verify the boxes themselves with the least amount of variables, then put them through your entire signal chain for the field and verify them again, because again, you're in introducing variables. So now let's walk through the actual data I got from tuning it. So once I had everything in the air, I'll show you after everything 
this is what I got. Let me pull up my target trace here. And I was pretty happy with that. So that was on axis when the boxes were in the air. I'll show you a better picture. So I had them in the air. I think it was 32 feet to the bottom box. And this is the very back microphone. So the upper balcony pointed right at the array that had another one right here below it. Here was where I put the first row, or I guess it was in the third row because we might we actually ended up losing the front fills. That was my uh, D microphone. Here is C, they had one right in the middle up here. And then that first one we saw was way up here. So each of those four spots, this is the data that I got. I was able to tune the array and I feel pretty happy with that. That front row little 2K thing, it was kind of rough. And if I ducked it too much, I don't know if it was like a side, side lobe or something like that. But anyway, I was happy with it. And here is the average of the array, followed the curve and we were in good shape. We're going to eventually uh, take the other two subs and put them in a center array. We just didn't have the motors to do it this time. Again, it was a fun project. And what I learned is, you know, even though everything's good on the ground, make sure you go through your entire signal chain, verify what's going on, make sure everything is matching before you send it up, or you're going to be chasing your tail when you're tuning. I'm Michael Curtis. Make sure and grab my audio toolkit at the link below, and I'll catch you next time.